It's Ask Us Anything on the Goggler podcast. Bahir and Uma with you. Our first question for this week is something very close to our hearts because it's about food and drink. At My Tipsy Turvy asks, what are the top three food or drinks you have always wanted to try after seeing it in a movie or TV show but have never got to? And what do you imagine they taste like? This is a fan. Fantastic question, because God knows we spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about these things. But it's also the kind of thing where as soon as I saw that question, I thought to myself, I know I have an answer to this, but for some reason I'm blanking. It required some thought. It's also one of those things where I know it's a statement that's crossed my mind. I'm a fat man who loves his food, and I'm sure I've seen something on TV and just gone, oh, I wonder what that tastes like. That said... The first item on our list came to me immediately. That's true. I agree. Yeah. And we both share this yes. item. Yeah. 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 It's the Cubano sandwich from Chef. Yes. Yes. Of course, we'll have to get them to make a halal version for you. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I appreciate the thought. I will be the the dummy who will say, but it won't be the same. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, you know. I oh. think they can pull it off. I know pork has a very distinct flavor and the ham they use probably does. Sure. However, I think there are a lot of other things in a Cubano with the sauces and the mustard and all of that stuff that actually adds to the flavor of it. Yeah. It's the style of the cooking and the pressing and all of that stuff. Those two big slices of pickles. Just, nobody here cuts it lengthwise. Yeah. Nobody here cuts it lengthwise. You know what? I think John Favreau will oblige you by it. I appreciate version. that. Yes. I would really, truly appreciate that. All right. What else is on your list? This one was a bit of a random one only because it's not something particularly spectacular, but just the way it looked on screen. That steak from The Matrix. Oh, Yeah. I've had very good steak before and I've had very good steak cooked that way before. But there was just something about the way that steak was filmed. It just makes my mouth water. I can't, I don't know. I have always wanted to try a cat's delicatessen sandwich. Mm. When Harry met Sally, they're in cat's delicatessen. I'll have what she's having, etc., etc. But the actual sandwich from cat's delicatessen, I've seen it online, not just in movies and TV shows, mm. but I've never actually been to Cat's Delicatessen in New York. Sure. And I would love to go there and I would love to try that sandwich. I don't know what it would taste like because it looks like there is far too much meat between those slices of bread, but I want to try it. Cat's would probably be a Jewish deli, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, I think you're right. It's that there's just too much meat in that bread that you just go... That is ridiculously stupid or costs way too much money. But at the same time, you want it. Because you know the meat is cooked to a level where it's probably going to melt in your mouth. It's just going to fall apart, right? Exactly. It's just the way the Jewish delis do it. I've had salted beef in, in London. Oh, yeah. I had a salted beef sandwich when I was in LA. It just falls apart. Oh, you stupid man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it didn't occur to me only because... In my head, I've had other sort of Jewish-style deli sandwiches, so it wasn't particularly high up on my list. But no, no, yeah, you're right. Now that you've mentioned it, I'm seeing it in my brain now. All right, what else you got? For me, this is kind of like, I feel like what the spirit of the question is. Not necessarily real foods we never tried. It's almost like fictional foods. And Lembas bread from Lord of the Rings. I just figured that's like Roti Chanai. In my head. In my head. But it doesn't look like roti chanai, dude. Look, it looks a little more like pita, right? Yeah, it looks like a pita type style bread. Yeah, but also a bit stiff almost looking. Yeah. Doesn't break like a focaccia would, but... I'm assuming it's not going to be too dry because that's all they ate. But that's the point, right? It's not supposed to be dry. I mean, you've read the book, so you yeah. know the description of the lembas bread. That even if you have a small handful you will be full the whole day. It never goes bad. It's never too salty or too flavorless. It's always perfect all the time. And I think that was the point. Forget Ozempic. La. That is the ultimate diet food. La. For me, that would probably be the ultimate diet food. Yeah. I wanted to try, and this is not fictional. This is real. But there is the Stanley Tucci movie, Big Night, you know, where he's a chef. Sure. And I've never had this before, but it's an Italian dish called timbalo, which is essentially like a Pasta lasagna 
if that makes sense. It's a baked dish and you can make it with pasta, rice, or potatoes. Oh. But it's layered as well. Okay. And it looked amazing. And it's like a version of lasagna from what I understand. And I've never, ever tried it. And I've never encountered it at a restaurant, even when I've been traveling in Italy. So I really want to try Timbalo. Never seen that movie, so I have to look it up. As for what I imagine it would taste like, just carb heaven. La. <laughs> just pasta on pasta on pasta and cream. Is Correct. it cream-based or tomato-based? Meat tomatoes. I don't know if there's a cream version because there's a cream-based lasagna as well. So I don't know if there are modifications. I need to try it. I mean, that's three already, but we've got more for you, my Tipsy Tevi. Let's just run through these quickly. My next one will probably be the chocolate cake from Matilda. Looked so damn good. I also want to try cherry pie from Twin Peaks. Yeah, good call. Like diner cherry pie. The way the show makes it sound, just, ah, uh, I need to try that. Good call. Also, the last food on my list is, and I think this is fictional, like we've all had pizza. Sure. But I want pizza from Sal's in Do the Right Thing. Yeah. That's what I want. Mm. I don't know what that pizza tastes like, but I'm sure it's amazing. Franklin's Barbecue. From any time Franklin shows up in the film. <laughs> I want to go there. I want to go there. Look, I hate standing in line, but I think I might be able to stand in line for a Franklin. I agree. Yeah. I know my Tipsy Turvy is a big cocktail guy. So mm. to add to the drink part of the question, I had my first ever white Russian after watching The Big Lebowski because I never knew what a white Russian was. And that movie inspired me to have a white Russian, which I really enjoy because it's just a creamy, milky, sweet drink. Oh. Also, as for something I would like to try that sounds awful, but is in a TV show, a flaming mo from The Simpsons, which is made with cough syrup and lit on fire. I think it's actually available at Universal Studios. Although I'm not sure they use actual cough syrup. I Probably don't know if that's not. legal. I don't think they can. Yeah. But I want to try a flaming mouse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have cough syrup all the time. You just need to set it on fire. At Chess Chess asks, I want to know your thoughts on the remarkable life of Evelyn. I haven't seen it. Neither have I. But I wanted to address this question because I hadn't even heard of it mm, until same. she asked the question and I looked it up. And it looks pretty incredible. Yeah. So we're going to check it out for sure. And we will give you a review once we have. And thank you for the recommendation. It looks like a sad documentary. It does look like a very <laughs> sad documentary. Why, yes. Chess Chess? Why? Why do you do this to us? It's about gaming and a guy who is ill. And yeah. Also, just how he's touched other people. I hate those kind of documentaries. But I will watch it. Because it makes you feel things. By it makes me feel things. I hate feeling things. At Kabe Singh asks, with the release of Gladiator too, would you guys be interested in doing a ranking list of top 10 legacy sequels of all time or something to that effect? Yet again, another great recommendation for content for Goggler. Thank you very much, Kaber Singh. But yes, we've never done that. And I think it makes for a very interesting conversation. Yeah. Especially in these situations where the sequel is coming, what, two decades after the original? We've seen quite a few of those, right? Like Ghostbusters is technically a legacy sequel. And and I have to say this. I prefer a good legacy sequel to a requel, which is a rebooted sequel. The female-led Ghostbusters was almost a requel, not a legacy sequel. And I feel that had its fair share of issues. I disagree. I think that's just a straight-up reboot. Because it's not in yeah, the same universe. True. So technically, it's not a requel. That's true. Yeah, it's a it's a straight up reboot because they ignore everything that was anything about the first two films. Yeah, fuck good those point, guys. Good point. Yeah, yeah, I take it back. At Kieran Jacob fifteen asks two questions. In anticipation of Gladiator two, which Ridley Scott film that was not well received are your favorites? Mine was probably The Counselor. I mine would be Kingdom of Heaven. Same. Yeah. Man, I fucking love that movie. Even the original cut. I don't know why people were so angry at it. Here's the thing. The director's cut is a far superior film. Like, Absolutely. far superior film. Completely agree. However, when I watched the original cut, I kind of enjoyed that too. I watched the original cut and I was like, I don't understand why people were so angry at this. I don't get it. It was yeah. fine. Sure, historical inaccuracies potentially, but fuck it lah. It's Ridley Scott doing an action movie. It's okay. I feel like the historical argument is the same problem you have with Gladiator and most likely Gladiator too, because people are losing their shit about the trailer already. Okay. And... I don't know if I'm walking in to watch 
a movie like Gladiator or Gladiator 2 to learn about history. Or Napoleon for that matter. Exactly. I yeah. think what movies like this do, if done well, is to actually get you excited and interested about it. And then you go and learn some stuff and do some extra reading. Mm. I mean, Jurassic Park did that for me in that the film is nowhere near accurate with regards to science. Mm. And now, I don't think even the new movies are going to add feathers to dinosaurs. So all of that stuff you can throw out the window with regards to scientific accuracy, right? I know the last Jurassic movie had one dinosaur which had some feathers on it. Flirted with the idea. Flirted with the idea and then nothing more. The novel, mind you, was a little more historically, scientifically accurate. But, but what it did when I watched it as a kid, was get very excited about dinosaurs and go and learn some stuff and then buy some more books, et cetera, et cetera. That's what a movie like this should do, right? Yeah, exactly. But Kingdom of Heaven, I think, is his most underrated work. At Kieran Jacobs' second question is, with the US elections around the corner, what are your must-watch films that touch on politics? Also, what are your thoughts on Alex Garland's Civil War? Did we ever do a review of Civil War? It occurred to me that we did not. Okay, we should probably do that. Because I watched it in Singapore. Yes. And it was a while before you watched it because you waited for it to come out on HBO. Yes. And I think we definitely need to do a review about Civil War because we both loved it. And honestly, it's not speculative fiction for me. It's a warning. Yeah. I feel like with everything that's happened over the last few months in the US elections, what happened in that movie can come true. Yeah, it's a potential future in the multiverse, right? Exactly. It is not as out there as, say, aliens showing up. Correct. I think Alex Garland was very careful when that was made in that a lot of the arguments within the movie was not outside the realm of possibility. The way the nation was split up, the way the sides were drawn, none of it jumped out at me when I was watching it. None of it made me go, that would never happen. It genuinely felt like a warning. Yeah. I mean, both Bahir and I really enjoy this genre of film. So we have a long list of movies that touch on politics. You know what I realized I don't have a lot of? UK politics. Actually, that's true. I think the original House of Cards. Yeah, never saw that. And probably Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. Never saw those. Actually, forget the UK House of Cards. I mean, it's good. But if you want to watch something, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, fucking funny. But also... Because of the way our political systems twin, mm. it actually feels highly relevant to Malaysia. Right, okay. In that relationship with the ministers and the civil servants. Right. The only thing which is slightly different is in the UK, the civil servants have a lot more power because they're the eternal thing in the yes. civil service. Yeah. The ministers come and go, but the civil servants kind of run the show. American politics, we have tons. All the president's men... If you've listened to this podcast for any any amount of time, you will know that we're obsessed with the West Wing. Oliver Stone's JFK, Charlie Wilson's War, Wag the Dog, all fantastic, fantastic. There was an old TV show, which is very hard to find right now, but I think you may be able to stream episodes on YouTube called Jack and Bobby. Never seen it, dude. It is super, super fucking soapy, but the concept was pretty cool. It's called Jack and Bobby. And it tells the story of two brothers, one of which grows up to be president. The main bulk of the show happens in, in inverted commas, the past, because it talks about their childhood. But the rest of the show is talking heads documentary style, where people who worked with the president talk about this character and his legacy and his life. You know what's funny? Now that you mentioned it, you know what it sounds like? Diary of a Future President. Oh. That Disney Plus show. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Jack and Bobby was very good. There was also that Ryan Gosling, George Clooney one. Did you see that? It was based on a stage play. Ides of March. Ides of March. That's the one. I enjoyed that as well. I'm sure I've seen it, or I think I've seen it, but I don't remember anything about it, so I have to go rewatch it. Hollywood has always been fascinated with American politics. And so there are so many countless, countless TV shows and movies that you can watch. I mean, even if you look at something like Veep, Commander in Chief. American President. Even if you want something a little psycho, then just go for Kiefer and Designated Survivor. Lah. But also then there's also the political adjacent ones, right? Things like The Post, 
Frost Nixon, which I fucking love Frost Nixon. If you're looking at something a little more local politics, what is that film about the Boston Church scandal? Spotlight. Spotlight, yeah. Again, political adjacent, not necessarily politics, but lowercase p politics involved. All of that aside, I mean, they're really fascinating shows and movies and really well made. And a lot of them are interesting because I think they tap into fascinating what ifs and they and they really inform you about how the system in America works. However, I think the be all end all piece of work is the West Wing, because if you actually want to learn something about the politics and the system and the complications that exist within the system, all of those checks and balances and If you're asking yourself, why is America like this? I think the West Wing does the best job to explain why. Yeah. And it's definitely worth your time. Yeah. At Tapao Z asks, Vision Quest, what possible storyline would Kevin Feige and the powers at B over at Marvel Studios treat the fans with? I ask this because to my knowledge, Vision is predominantly a supporting character, even in the comics. I am more than happy to be corrected though. So, I think, and I don't know if they will take this road because a lot of this runs in parallel to what actually happened in WandaVision. But Tom King wrote a fantastic limited series called The Visions. And in that one, Vision has his own family. He creates a wife and children and a dog, all of them Vision-like robots, and they live this perfect suburban life until something goes horribly wrong. And it ends up being this weird, random murder mystery type thing. But of course, Vision has in many ways gone rogue in this comic book series. And the Avengers are trying to convince him to come back into the fold and give up all of this nonsense that he's doing. A lot of that's very similar to what happened in WandaVision. And so I don't know if they will go down that route. But the Tom King novels are a fantastic template. Like, Tapao, if you've never read any proper Vision stories... That's a great place to start. It is so well written. It is so good. The Visions. As for Vision being a supporting character, yes, that is partly true. However, within the pages of Avengers, and I think West Coast Avengers, he's had multiple arcs about him and Wanda and getting married and all of these things. So while he is a supporting character, there have been comic book arcs within the bigger Avenger storylines that focused on Vision. So there's quite a few Vision stories out there, which they could tap into. That said, I think the MCU, a lot like what happened with Agatha, is going to build off what has already happened within the cinematic universe as opposed to the comic book universe, which is probably the smartest thing to do because I don't know if you finished watching Agatha, but God damn, that show is good. Last week, someone was talking to us about whether we wanted to revise our score on reviews, like how often we do that. I was thinking about Agatha and going back and revising my score because those last three episodes were like, fuck. I've seen all of it. Don't know if I agree with you. Oh. Not not in that I hated it. It's just, it really felt like, what the fuck? What now? And I think that was what annoyed me. Oh, really? Because I really like that bit. The penultimate episode, when you think everything is over and then it's not, I was because I was like, oh, it's done. But isn't there an episode nine? And then stuff happens and I'm like, oh, shit. I will say I'm looking forward to Vision Quest only because I like the character of Vision. And I think that this might be a sort of side door in for him back to the MCU, which I like. Also... Paul Bettany, man. I want more of him as Vision, yeah. Exactly. At Kyla Schlaxman asks, since we're closing in to the end of the year and the Oscars coming up, what are some of the standout films this year that you think stand a good chance of winning big in the Oscars next year? So before we get into this, just a note by it, we had at least three other questions from oh. people asking us about our best movie picks of the year. Now, it's not even December yet, And we're holding off only because a lot of those movies haven't been released. Especially with those Oscar picks, they tend to release it October, November, December. They've done the festival circuits and then they kind of release it closer to the date of the Oscars so that voters have it fresher in their mind when it comes to voting. 
And so a lot of the movies that we want to talk about, we haven't seen, no one's seen, because some of them are just about to come out. For me, my top pick will probably be Civil War. I agree. Unless Trump wins, then they'll probably ignore it. Unless Trump wins and then there's an actual Civil War, like no Oscars. Then that just doesn't happen. Yeah, I think, I don't know why I have a feeling like if Donald Trump wins, I think they will try and ignore Civil War and not to piss off Republicans everywhere. For me, it'll be Civil War. I'm really looking forward to the substance. I haven't seen it yet. There's also Sebastian Stan's A Different Man, which I've I read really a lot about. That. I really want to watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My only critique of your list is that horror gets no love ever. That's and true. so I don't know if the substance will make it in, even though it's really fucking good. There's a lot there that they might ignore it being a horror movie. The only thing that I'm hoping for is it's a big comeback for Demi Moore. Yeah, same. So I'm hoping that, you know, Hollywood loves themselves a big comeback. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping that pushes it through somehow. Yeah. Uh, The other things that I've heard really good things about, but haven't seen, obviously, because they haven't been released here or in many places in the world, Anora is getting a lot of great buzz. Emilia Perez, the Selena Gomez movie, is getting huge buzz. I think that one's actually coming to Netflix. Yes, yeah. Uh, as is Maria, which is about Maria Callas. And I think that's supposed to be very good. And I'm super excited about the conclave. Yeah, same. The cast looks amazing. And also just anything about the papacy and all of the secret dealings that go on in the Vatican just yeah. excites me. Like. I, I, I'm completely on board with you on that. Yeah. I just hope that because it was released early in the year, Dune does not get overlooked. Because I think Denis Villeneuve I know it's the second movie of a planned trilogy, but I think Denis Villeneuve pulled off what Peter Jackson did in adapting the seemingly unadaptable. I think Dune will probably get technical and production awards. I don't know about any of the bigger ones. I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't think Timmy Boy will get Best Actor. Oh, I don't think that, but I think think it needs like a Best Picture, Best Director nod. It might get a norm. I don't know. I feel like it won't. I just feel like in a year with... The list that we have, I feel like they won't go into something commercial like Dune Part 2. I hear that Marvel's really making a big push for Deadpool Wolverine. So I don't know what that means. Also because Inside Out, Deadpool Wolverine essentially saved the US box office. Yeah, true. By quickly busting through that billion dollar barrier. I hope that doesn't influence the animation category, though, because I think Wild Robot deserves that win. But Mm. we'll see. We'll see. But we're saving our full lists for December, guys. So be patient. We want to watch as many of these movies as we can before releasing a list. At Ken Gatson asks, which actor or actress in Hollywood were you, one, most surprised to see speak up for a presidential candidate, two, least surprised, And three, disgusted to see during the elections for whatever reason. I think Bahir and I probably share a very similar list. Most surprised and disgusted would probably go to Zachary Levy and Dennis Quaid. If only because we genuinely liked them as actors and loved their performances in a lot of shows and movies... But then to see their arguments in support of Trump feel incredibly misguided. I I don't know. You're giving them too much credit by calling it misguided, I feel like. I don't know. I saw this live stream with Zachary Levy the other day. Yeah. And he was still going on about draining the swamp. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? People have real problems in your country. Yeah. Uh, And you're talking about this fictional swamp that Donald Trump wants to drain because he has a great team behind him like Elon Musk. I'm like, all of these people don't actually have the moral credentials to back anything that they're saying up. Yeah. I mean, for me, Zachary Levi was surprising. I think Dennis Quaid is most disgusting. Like, I get... I get it. Randy's a loony bin of a of a guy, and I, and that's okay. But like for Dennis Quaid to step up and not only just say he's in support of, but to also speak at a rally for Trump with Trump, I just thought, man, I thought you were, I thought you were better than that. Least surprised would probably be the cast of The West Wing. 
because they show up at local elections too. They're like incredibly political individuals. And I think working on that show had a lot to do with it. There's a book out, which is about the history of the West Wing, but also their political activism. And it's a really good read. And also it's a very interesting bridge that shows you how actors use their influence for good. And for me, the least surprising is also Mark Ruffalo because he's probably one of the most activist actors out there. Yeah, he's constantly talking about it. I mean, he was the first to come out about Gaza, right? He yeah. was just like, you got to stop this shit right now. And he's he's always in the front of the line when it comes to these things. I will also say, I used to follow Mark Ruffalo on Twitter. Not that I don't follow him anymore. I just don't go on Twitter anymore. But he would also take Democrats to task. He's not one-sided at all. Like If he sees a wrong, he will call you out on it. And I appreciate that. You know who else I found quite surprising? Taylor Swift. Because I know she used to be political. And in the documentary Miss Americana, they talk about her politics. But I was surprised that she came out only because from a lot of what I've read, it feels like the reason she doesn't come out is because it can be dangerous for her fans and supporters. As we've seen with the massive terrorist threat in Amsterdam, for example. And I think there was a worry that if she came out in support of Kamala Harris, whether fans could become a target, her concerts could become a target, because America's an incredibly violent country. But I also feel like she had to, because if she didn't... That's true. The Republicans will claim her, right? And I feel like it would be worse, because then she would have to respond to them. So I feel like she just had to come out and do it. At Shazwan Rosman asks, I saw that Uma watched Megalopolis in Singapore. What is the censorship like over there? What is the experience? Is there IMAX? Because I was planning on heading over to watch movies there. So, yes, there is an equivalent of the LPF over there. However, Singapore's censorship is strictly along the lines of a rating system. And so I think the only things that they censor are gay sex or extreme gay sex. I think kissing is all right. But if there's any homosexual activity on screen, the movie is either given a 21 rating or they may make some minor cuts. Right. But other than that, a lot of the films get through with very little cuts. They may end up getting a higher than usual rating. So for example, I think Lightyear was not a children's film in Singapore. I think Lightyear got an 18 rating or something silly like that because of that one scene. But they actually follow a rating system which is what we should do. That's it. That's it. The cinematic experience in Singapore is garbage because Singaporeans have a lot to do. So they got concerts, they got museums, they got art galleries, they got all of these things to do. They have good museums and they have good art galleries. And because of that, they don't spend as much time going to the cinema. And so... The cinematic experience in Malaysia is far superior. We have better screens, better seats. Our cinemas are renovated a lot more. It just feels more comfortable. It feels nicer. Yes, they have IMAX, but Singapore doesn't have a single laser IMAX, if I'm not mistaken. And so all of it feels pretty old. And watching movies there is the greatest. But yes, you get a relatively uncensored experience compared to what we get here. At Iman Bahare asks, to cap off the month, a fun question. If you could have a three-man Pokemon team of horror monsters, classic and modern, what would it be? Bahir, go. I have already ruined one of my choices because I didn't read the question correctly, but I will ignore it, Iman Bahari. My three-man team or three Pokemon team would be the wolf monster from Attack the Block, which was scary as shit. Predator from any of the Predator movies. And nice. the Witch King of Angmar from Lord of the Rings. Fucking cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I fucked up a little bit because technically Lord of the Rings isn't a horror. But the Witch King of Angmar was pretty freaking scary. So I'm going to And he's a monster of sorts. So it works. Yeah. What are yours? I want Pinhead from Hellraiser because that fucker still scares the shit out of me. The Xenomorph from Alien. Because even when he dies, he will drip acid all over you and kill your ass. And Godzilla from Godzilla. I was thinking of Godzilla, but I felt like... I don't know why I went back on him. I just felt like... Felt too big. Just felt like a little, like, unfair. 
I don't know. Anyway, yeah, no, great choices though. I was also playing around with T-Rex from Jurassic Park. I know he's not technically a monster, but he was pretty scary. Oh, actually, she was pretty scary because they're all female. Yeah. Final question from at Rabbit Hop. What are some famous masterpiece movies that you haven't yet seen? Mine is Vertigo. Oh, Rabbit Hop, you got to get on Vertigo. Vertigo's good. Vertigo's real good. So before we answer this question, I was thinking about why I haven't seen some of these movies. Because there's no excuse anymore, right? Because these things are so readily available. If it's not on streaming, then maybe you can buy it on digital. There are ways to access these movies and find them. And yet, sometimes we haven't gotten around to doing it. And I think a lot of it boils down to mood. Would you agree with that, Bahe? I think it's mood. I think there are a lot of times that we feel like we need to be in the right mood to watch this movie. But also, I feel like at a time when Apple TV drops a new episode of something every Wednesday, Thursday, Netflix drops Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays now, Prime does Thursdays and Fridays, Cinema does Thursdays. It's a lot of content out there. I do feel bad because as someone who does the work that we do, I feel like some of the things on my list are absolutely crucial watches that I just haven't gotten around to. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Like, we've had this conversation before and it's come up a couple of times. You've been shocked at the films that I haven't seen. Yeah. What are those movies, do you remember? That you haven't seen. That has shook you. I can't remember. That has made you almost fire me. Yeah, I know whenever you mentioned it, I was just like, what the fuck, bro? Yeah. On the bright side, though, recently you have seen both Paddington movies. Thank God for that. Well, technically just the one. I haven't gotten around to two yet. You haven't gotten around to Paddington yeah. two yet? Okay, 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 fine. But you've seen Paddington one. Thank God for that. Iconic, classic, has to be watched, okay? That's one thing off your list. But I can't remember. I just know I was shocked every time. But there have been a few. So for me, the biggest missing jigsaw piece is probably Gone with the Wind. And only right. because... I'm not even sure if I've seen it. Like, I, I know I've seen clips because I remember my mom put it on one time. But I was too young, so it was too long. I was running in and out. Not enough gunfire. Too many people talking, you know? So... I may have technically seen it on my periphery, but I will consider that as having not seen because I cannot call it. So for me, Gone with the Wind. And I've also actually missed a lot of Hitchcock stuff. And I think with the Hitchcock stuff, there is so much. He made so many movies that you really need to sit down and put in the time if you want to catch up on sure. all of it. Yeah, yeah. But even with Hitchcock, much like directors like Woody Allen and Steven Spielberg, there are key pieces of work that you have to watch. And I think you're okay if you've only seen those key pieces. North by Northwest, Vertigo, Rear Window, yeah. Birds, Psycho. Psycho. Yeah, those I've seen. For me, I think the biggest hole, and I really need to get around to watching this, is Heaven's Gate. Oh. So Michael Simino's Heaven's Gate, 1980, epic Western, just one of the most problem-plagued movies of all time. It is considered to be one of the worst movies of all time, mind you. Although, like a lot of these movies, there are some hardcore defenders. And not just the kind of people who go, oh, it's not as bad as you think it is. No, no, no. I mean people who go, this thing's a motherfucking masterpiece. Mm. But there were cost overruns, significant reshoots. There was allegations of animal abuse on set. He was apparently this real dictatorial director. Everything that could have gone wrong with this movie went wrong. And of course, it had Chris Christopherson, Christopher Walken, John Hurt, Sam Waterston, Isabel Hubert, Jeff Bridges, Joseph Cotton. Fantastic cast. I really want to watch the movie. I know there are multiple versions and multiple recuts of the film but I really want to watch this movie. Yeah, I haven't seen that one either. Like, the budget of the movie back in 1980 was $44 million, And it only took $3 million at the box office. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a bad time out, guys. Like, on all of the lists of worst films ever made, at some point, Heaven's Gate pops up. But I really want to watch it. We've spoken about this before, right? There are times when you are stuck in a place and you are engulfed by noise and you get caught up in it and then it affects the way you watch or read something and i'm wondering if 40 years down the line 
looking back on something like this, maybe it isn't as bad as we remember. Or it isn't as bad as you thought it was, right? I don't think that's going to be the case in Megalopolis because it's just terrible. I really, I really can't wait for you to watch this movie. Oh, I'm waiting for it to show up on VOD. It's gonna be so good. I'm willing to spend money on that. Just I'm telling you, the both of us need to sit down and do like a Mystery Science Theater 3000 watch of Megalopolis. Oh, you know what we do? We record audio as we watch it. Yes. So it's almost like a live commentary, right? So don't have to worry about video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, I think we should do it when it's my first watch. Oh, it has to be your first watch. Then my frustrations will be so... Im- your oh, reactions so are just going great. to be what the fuck the whole yeah. time. So good. So good. Uh, that was our final question for this week's edition of Ask Us Anything. You know what to do. Keep those questions coming in. You can reach out on all of our social media feeds, Goggler MY. You can also email us on podcast at goggler.my or send us a WhatsApp on the Goggler hotline, 012-524-5208. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Goggler Podcast.